community engagement. Um, and uh, we are rolling out a course next year based on my dissertation research. And so part of what I'm going to be presenting to you today is um, the results of that research. And um, my question for you as we go into this is, are you connected to a community partner who might benefit from the collaboration with music students from our school? <laughs> um, so with the Wisconsin idea at the Mead Witter School of Music, we say that we are the Wisconsin idea in its most audible form. Um, <laughs> it, um, we want to make the, our collaborators um, not just passive recipients. How often do we go to classical music concerts and we just accept what is given to us versus participate in it? And so part of the work that my students do will be um, working in collaboration with community partners. Um, our goal being that we bring value to the invisible. Um, from my research, one of the participants said, it is an artist's utmost responsibility to use their craft as a tool to get into the community and talk about life's bigger issues. So this is just an overview of today. I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about my curriculum rationale, a literature review um, in which uh, people uh, shared just like I spoke with you about your art class and music or in community engagement. Um, it's uh, similar sort of things and how we can transfer that into uh, music community engagement. Um, I interview research findings, a little bit about my teaching philosophy and then um, getting into the curriculum. So the curriculum rationale is to bring experiential learning opportunities for students. So often musicians go into the profession and um, don't know how to introduce their piece, don't know how to relate to the people that um, they're performing for or collaborating with. And um, part of what I gained was during a fellowship program with the Civic Orchestra of Chicago, the training orchestra of the Chicago Symphony, in which we created hundreds of community engagement um, efforts and um, were able to work with uh, students um, who were part of our orchestra or chamber groups that were part of our orchestra. Um, yeah, and then, so the literature that I read um, was from Lawton. She talked about um, creating a local interest narrative and Myers talked a little bit more about collaboration. Peter Block's book uh, talks about relating to those in the community, the creating a possibility, having your collaborators take ownership of the project, um, welcoming honest dissent to form commitments and celebrating the gifts of everybody that um, is present, not just the musicians, but everyone as a part of the collaboration. Um, Wallace comes from it as a music performing standpoint, how can we have our audiences give them an entry point, something tangible, not just talking about the historical narrative of a composer, but how do we make this performance come alive? How do we make it an exploratory method for all versus an informatory method? And then Booth talks about the teaching artist. How do we work with K through 12 initiatives um, in an effective way? These were uh, research findings of Sarah Senso. She talked about the transition from the music student to the professional musician. How that's one of the hardest points um, in life. And I think that's true for any, any other degree. How do we make that transition from student professional? Um, and then how do we make that co-beneficiary model? How do we connect in a way that um, is not a giver receiver, but it is a mutual benefit? And then that is what creates a community capital, a creative community capital. Um, and so that will have benefit for all. So my research questions, the three overarching research questions were, um, and I interviewed uh, uh, musicians who are professionals as well as uh, music administrators who, um, who work with professional musicians. And uh, what I wanted to find out was from, from the literature research, it led me to want to figure out more about this. What variety of community engagement activities have interview participants undertaken? 
what do interview participants perceive as the qualities of successful community engagement and what personal and artistic skills are needed for successful community engagement and how might music majors learn them? My interview questions never outright asked any of these questions, but some of the more interesting questions that led to um, themes were, what springs to mind when you think of community engagement work that has lasting impacts? Do you have any advice on finding, developing, facilitating collaborative community partnerships? And how do you decide on an objective for a community engagement project? How do you keep the project in line with these objectives? Do you ever change objectives during the process? And how do you measure the outcomes of your project? The findings were um, for the first, my first overarching research question led to themes of um, attracting new audiences to the concert hall, bringing music to people who do not currently have access or are unable to come to the concert hall, performing music in non-traditional concert spaces, and providing quality K through 12 educational initiatives. One of the interview participants said um, that uh, creating purposes beyond the music itself, um, which fortified the experiences and relatedness of the performance performers and their audiences. So my second research question about um, what are the qualities of successful community engagement, um, it led to being able to relate what you're doing to local culture and being able to choose the right community partners and to measure the outcome metrics, whether that be qualitative or quantitative. Here's what our, our collaborations have traditionally looked like in the past. Here's what we can do as musicians, but we want to make it special for your group. We want to know what you do and what we can do coming alongside of what you already do to make something new and fresh. So the third question was, what personal and artistic skills do students need to learn while they're in school? Um, the themes were, we need to learn how to be better communicators. We need to learn how to have flexibility and deal with our own perfectionism. So being willing to make mistakes, being willing to be vulnerable and try new things had great rewards. So my teaching philosophy, and I was so challenged by your first presentation because I always think the, the community that we create in the classroom is gonna reflect out into our work in the community. And you guys took it one step further being like, we can't necessarily count on that. So we have to set up that engagement out in the community. I loved it, it was so good. So thank you, that was so great. So um, having that quality of investment. Um, and then it's my responsibility um, to create exercises that are um, gonna spur on creativity in their work, as well as um, create quality discussion and reflection and generate opportunities. It's not my job to have the answers to all of their questions. And sometimes it's good to answer a question with another question and, and spur on more thought that way. So a little bit about the teaching philosophy behind my curriculum is from Shiro, Kolb, and Jorgensen. Basically that it's um, the learner-centered curriculum. Um, some classroom techniques that are really fun and helpful are um, the fishbowl technique. And this can help the shy student feel like they are important. You take a few students and put them in the center and the rest of the class sits in a circle around them. And only those three people are able to discuss the matter at hand and the rest are observers. And then we switch who's in the center in the hot seat. Um, doing pair work is really effective, especially when you have the pair share what the other person said in the pair work versus because um, sometimes when you share your own thoughts, it feels a little vulnerable. And then another way is sometimes when we're speaking, we forget what we're going to say. So if we just write down our thoughts ahead of time, um, then in the heat of the moment when you're sharing your own thoughts, you always have that written thing to go to. And then sometimes it's helpful to share your idea with three people, and then you will work up a little more courage to share it with six people, and then you can present it to the classroom. Um, so fostering that classroom community um, uh, is just important to not duck 
controversy. We need to work through um, the difficult questions and the difficult conversations um, in order to um, create strength and um, courage to step outside of the classroom. So um, one book that we'll read is by Twyla Tharp, the famous choreographer um, out in New York City Ballet. And she um, talks about how to create self-reliance in your own work, how to be innovative and how to um, take other disciplines and put them together and how that actually makes something innovative. And so um, thinking about our projects, what we do as musicians and what someone else does that has nothing to do with music, if we can find a meeting point just doing what we already do, then that's gonna be an effective collaboration. So the creative life has the nourishing power we normally associate with food, love, and faith. So our curriculum design um, is geared towards the student participating in a di diverse exploration of the Madison area of the community to grow the personal and artistic skills needed to be engaged with the community, as well as to create an innovative and collaborative project. Um, my mentor in my program through the Civic Orchestra was um, the famous cellist Yo-Yo Ma, and he always um, talked to us about this, but culture, one quote I wrote down and remembered was cultural and educational work depends on one thing. No matter what we do in the arts, in the sciences, architecture, it only matters what people remember. So my research questions influencing um, parts and activities in the classroom. Um, the first theme was to attract new audiences. Um, and these are just some of the uh, classroom uh, things that we're doing. So uh, 20 questions is coming up with questions as a classroom in things that we want to explore. There's no right or wrong. And the reason we want 20 is because often the most off the beaten path answer, the 20th question that we ask is actually sometimes the most important one. Um, partnering, um, understanding the social service agencies that we have in Madison and seeing if uh, musicians might want to work with that, if that's something that they care about. Finding non-traditional spaces, rapid fire. So that's just going around the classroom. Where have we not heard music before? The grocery store, all these different things that come up and um, coming up with quick answers um, on the fly. Uh, and then the last one is uh, through K through 12 initiatives. Um, we're going to do small group presentations, um, figuring out what is Madison Public Schools doing? What are they doing? And what can we do to enhance um, what they are doing? And it might not even be in the music classroom. It might be in a science classroom. Uh, and how can, we, how can we work with that effectively? Um, relating to local culture, go for a walk, notice how maybe in the coffee shop, how do people get their information? Are they doing it on their cell phones? Are they doing it with the brochures at the door? Are they um, talking with people? And however people get their information, um, being able to um, use that uh, as information on how we want to market the collaboration that we're doing. Finding the right community partners. Three Spines was a, um, a really good, a good idea with creating uh, in your small groups, creating three projects that you want to work on, um, and then creating details beyond those. Instead of saying, this is my one project, I'm going to do this, creating three and then having the longer decision um, and, and knowing how to have the invitation letter, who you want to participate with. And you guys are talking a little bit about that. That was so fascinating. I learned so much. Um, so, uh, crafting that invitation letter based off of one of your spines. And when one of those doesn't work, you go to the second spine. Um, so you have other ideas. And then how do we measure success? Um, and in, in the student in the classroom, they're gonna be working on journal um, entries each week, but then at the end of the semester, having that reflective essay provides me also with qualitative feedback that I can use then for um, the future. And then the last one is developing personal and artistic skills. Um, how do we develop communication? So the classroom work is gonna be part of that. How do we develop flexibility? When we go to a site, how do we present our ideas in such a way that 
um, is met with a collaborative effort versus speaking at your collaborators. So um, how do we do that at our site visits? And then dealing with professionalism or perfectionism is um, all about the creative, the um, journal questions, but the creative autobiography is really cool. It's um, each student will bring in a picture from their childhood and what they see in themselves at that moment in reflection now 20 years later, what they felt at that moment and now what they see um, later in life than looking back at that moment. And they'll be sharing that with the classroom. Twyla Tharp um, said, the changing, ha changing habits to learn from failure is the biggest test in the creative process, demanding not only an admission that you've made a mistake, but that you know how to fix it. And it requires you to challenge the status quo of your own making. So in our classroom, this is some repertoire that um, composers have written where we could have flexible instrumentation. Maybe there will be a chamber group in my class, but maybe I have a violinist and a percussionist and an oboist. And what are we going to do when we play together? So these are just some ideas with that. Um, and then these are some potential collaborators that I've been thinking of um, in Madison. And I'm so eager um, to hear from all of you if you have any ideas for um, groups or people. Some of the, the first ones listed here are all ones at UW. Um, and then some are within music organizations, the Lunar Art Festival and the Willie Street Chamber Players are both alumni, as well as some of the leaders at the uh, WISO organization. i uh, got to go back. What happened? Sorry. Just that slide if you don't know. Yeah. Um, but so, uh, but I think some of the most unique partnerships will actually be ones that aren't with an organization that is already deeply rooted in music. Um, so like, what could we do at Bricks together, right? Like that would be so cool. <laughs> yeah. So um, we have, we'll have like jazz musicians in the class and I mean, just so many different types of musicians um, that we could, yeah, collaborate with, but that's about it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Time for maybe a question. One question. You can also email me ideas if you want to collaborate with my students. So we're thinking of starting uh, spring 2024 is when the class, or class will roll out. Yeah. So we're yeah working through the approval process right now. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Oh, did you have a question for me? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is that an opportunity? Maybe there's a lot of people. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So the question is about belonging again, um, creating that sense of belonging and students who are from Wisconsin, if they could go back to their communities and engage in that way. Yeah. I think that does have meaningful. Um, one project that I've heard of is a student working with a Wisconsin composer and actually a composer from everywhere that they have lived. Uh, so they lit, grew up in um, Amarillo, Texas, and then went to school in Bloomington, Indiana, and is now here in Madison. Um, so commissioning a work by a composer from each of those locations, um, that is their sense of belonging and giving voice to um, people from their area. Uh, does that kind of yeah, that's kind of a cool project going on, but all right. Thank you so much. Yeah.